I think he's, yeah. Um, welcome to uh, Plenary 3. We'd like to invite people to take their seats and uh, we'll be starting in two or three minutes. So if anybody's outside uh, getting your coffee, uh, we'd invite you to come on in. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three, plenary three, of uh, this wonderful gin conference. Uh, my name is Eddie Lang, a um, member of the Scientific Planning Committee, and have the distinct pleasure of uh, moderating uh, this session along with uh, Vivian Welch, who will be my co-moderator. Hope everybody is doing well and uh, has, has enjoyed the conference so far. We have a phenomenal a plenary plan for you right this morning on the very important theme of uh, visualization of uh, information and recommendations and have uh, some really uh, impressive speakers who are going to be presenting for you. Um, our, our, um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our very first speaker. Very lucky to have uh, Malavika Tampi here from uh, Phoenix, Arizona who is currently a guideline specialist with uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America, who, as you most certainly know, have been very busy over the last uh, few years developing uh, high-profile and important uh, guidelines. Uh, so uh, Malavika is actually well known to the GIN audience. I think she's going to refer to this in her presentation. But uh, she was the previous winner of the Najwa Malika Kabane Award. And we're so pleased that she's come back in a plenary uh, speaking spot. Uh, her, you'll, you'll be able to see her very impressive profile on the uh, conference app. Uh, Malavika has worked with a number of societies has, and has worked uh, both with the, with, uh, very, in a very collaborative way with the Dental Association, College of Emergency Physicians, Dear to My Heart, and uh, a number of other uh, organizations and brings incredible expertise to, uh, to us this morning. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Malavika to uh, the podium. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here in front of all of you today. I'm a little bit nervous, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, thank you to the board and um, everyone here in this room for having me here today. I'm very excited to talk about my journey in guideline development. That's why I titled my presentation, Clinical Practice Guidelines and Dentistry, the field in which um, I, I've worked most of my career and for which I won the uh, Gen Innovation Award. And as the title of the presentation indicates, this has been quite the unexpected journey for me. I wanted to put up uh, my current affiliations and disclosures list on the slide, but also just mention that the award that was uh, given to me last year that I was honored with was in recognition of Dr. Mika Kabane, who was an innovator and guideline developer um, and a board trustee for many years before she passed. And she was known for her ability to bring people together and foster collaboration 
both within her teams as well as internationally. So this speech uh, and, of course, the award is in honor of her. When I was asked to present today, they had, had requested that I speak about my work and what led me to receiving this award. And it was really hard for me to figure out what to say because there was just so much to say. So many people I've worked with, so many experiences that I've had that I felt were important to share. But I reminded myself that sometimes when we talk about our work, we need to actually start with ourselves and who we are as people. And when I say starting with ourselves, I don't mean just me, Malavika. I mean all of you, each and every one of you. Why are you in this room today? I referenced uh, a poet and physician, Dr. William Carlos Williams, who um, is well known. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And he's described as having the propensity to capture the diversity of human illness in writing and use the power of the narrative to be able to tell um, the stories of patients, providers, and um, improve the uh, delivery of patient care. And a quote that's attributed to him is, they are two parts of a whole, that it is not two jobs at all, that one rests the man when the other fatigues him. And what he's trying to say with this quote is that it's very hard for us to separate who we are from what we do. And that makes sense, because when we are our best selves, we bring our best selves forward at work, and that reflects in the work itself. So this is something that I've always tried to remember, and that the people around me, the teams I've worked with, have always demonstrated to me and reminded me of when I've forgotten or lost my way. So I asked myself, who am I as an individual? And I wanted to share that with all of you before I got into talking about the work that I'm here um, representing today. I was born in a small town in the South Indian state of Kerala. It's a town called Trivandrum. And when I was five, I actually moved to the United States with my parents and my little sister. I wandered around the Midwest for a while, worked in Chicago, and then ended up in a place called Scottsdale, Arizona. It's in the southwest region of the United States. It's very hot and the opposite of Toronto. So it was quite a shock arriving here yesterday, but Toronto's beautiful. I'm so happy to be here. And these are the people um, and the dogs that matter to me. Um, I derive a lot of my identity from being a sister, a daughter, a friend, um, but also an Indian woman. And we're all here um, because of the international aspect of this conference. And so for me to identify uh, myself as not only an American, but as an Indian was very important to me. I'm also an artist and by no means a professional, um, but I enjoy photography and dance. I've been an Indian classical dancer my entire life. And these creative aspects of myself are parts of me that I bring to my work every single day, and that's why I felt it important to share. And talking about identities, my puppy Louie here um, has told me to tell you that the only identity that's important and worth sharing is that being his, of being his mom. So I've communicated that now, <laughs> so we can move on. Um, so again, when we talk about who we are as people, that leads into who we are as professionals. And we're at a professional conference, so I would encourage you to also ask yourselves, who are you as a professional and what are your goals? So when I was starting out my journey in guideline development, it was not the path that I would say a majority of us take, or maybe it is, and I would love to hear your stories afterwards. But I actually started my undergraduate degree in uh, food science at The Ohio State University in Ohio and quickly realized um, four, <laughs> four years in that this is not what I wanted to do. Wonderful profession, but my heart wasn't in it, and my mind exploded. I was like, what do I do? Where do I go? Where do I fit in? I'm confused. And I decided on public health as a general pool to jump in because I was passionate about healthcare. I knew I wanted to connect with people um, at every level and also just be involved in something meaningful that spoke to me and that I could show up for every single day based again on who I am as a person. And what I quickly realized as I went through my public health training at the University of Michigan, which is one of the top universities in the United States, was that I was doing well in my classes um, and really enjoying the work, but I was really struggling with feelings of fear and uncertainty. And whenever I felt uncertain about something, I would either par become extremely paralyzed or run away. Um, and so I taught myself different things, um, different 
ways to, to manage and cope with those uncertainties. And the number one thing I learned to do was reframe my perspective. And that's an, the ability to see an identical circumstance and think about it in a way that motivates you instead of makes you freeze and, and run away. Um, and this, again, tapped into my ability to be creative, the parts of me that are, are strong. Um, so I leaned into that and began my career at the American Dental Association. I had no experience really in dentistry, but I went to UCSF, San Francisco, um, University of California, San Francisco, for an internship during my time in my public health program. And I was working at the dental school there, and I became very interested in dentistry, applied to the ADA, got in, and that was my first job out of, um, out of my master's. And it was so overwhelming and confusing. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what a guideline was. I didn't know what a systematic review was. And um, initially, I was a research assistant. I was working on podcasts and critical summaries, which are just critical appraisals of systematic reviews and other sorts of small tasks related to systematic review development. But as time went on, my interest grew, and I realized that the uncertainty I was feeling was completely normal. A lot of people were going through it, and that I just had to stick it out and figure it out, and that I could do it. Um, around 2015, Alonzo, my supervisor at the ADA, started working there, and I remember him sitting me down at a cafe uh, across from the American Dental Association and asking me, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Because he could see that my eyes were just kind of glazed over all the time. And I, I told him, I said, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be a researcher. And he said, give me a few months. Let me try to convince you. <laughs> and he really did convince me. Um, he spent months and months and months, many days, many nights, teaching me everything about grade, about the evidence decision framework, and everything in between. And some of the most important lessons he taught me was um, how to, to work with guideline panels, how to make them feel seen and heard, and for, uh, to encourage them to bring their patients' perspectives forward as well. And also, I think part of this process, again, with who I am, I was very afraid to ask those silly questions. And he made it OK for me to ask those questions. So I wanted to thank him. And, I was very inspired by his successes and the successes of the people that he learned from as well um, through his, his education at McMaster. So this is generally the framework that we followed when we were building our guideline development program at the ADA. We asked a lot of why though questions. Um, we didn't really know where we wanted to go with the program. Things had been floundering for a while in terms of our direction. And we asked ourselves, where do guidelines fit in? Where do we want to take the program in terms of um, our, our, our portfolio? And how do we make these usable and trustworthy? How are these guidelines being received? And how do we communicate their impact? Because to grow the program, to build resources, um, to be able to do this work quickly and effectively, we needed to have that influence and those resources. And so. We really honed in on some of the most important topics in dentistry, but also we thought about how do we tell the story of dentistry and how do we tell the story of all of the, the clinical topics we were working on. And this was really tough because I don't think that we really knew how to do it and we just got creative with it. And again, these are the strengths that you know I had and my teammates had when we were putting together these types of pictures for us to make decisions based off of. So these aren't um, there's nothing particularly scientific about the, the image that you see on the screen. We were simply just mapping out all of the different ways antibiotics are used in dentistry and just planning a starting point. Where did we want to start with our first guideline? And when we were presenting, or when, after we'd convened our guideline panel and presenting those initial slides to them, we also wanted them to see that we really heard them, that we listened to them. We knew where they wanted to go at, a, at the big picture level in terms of um, guidelines on antibiotic use, but that really we were starting with the one in red, pulpal periapical regions of, of the mouth, that those were where we wanted to start it because that's what we had the resources to do and that's what we were being asked to do. So it helped reassure them and move us forward. So we ended up with many publications, both systematic reviews and guidelines, and the numbers were very impressive in terms of metrics. And these are just the metrics that we were able to collect. There are several hundreds of thousands more impressions that were made based on these guidelines. These included social media impressions, um, educational workshops, people requesting our chairside guides. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of chairside guides were sent out. And I'll show what those are in a minute. But 
there are so many ways that this um, work impacted the dental profession, and we were really fortunate to be able to bring this content to the field of dentistry. Other ways in which we shared our content was outside of scientific publications and peer-reviewed journals was through videos. And I chose to display this video and the following one, which is in Spanish, um, because we explored a little bit more deeply the, the use of antibiotics in dentistry and what some of the challenges were from a clinical practice perspective. So we saw that um, when clinicians were treating their patients, patients were oftentimes saying to them, well, antibiotics are always good. I really want antibiotics just in case. And even clinicians were saying, give me the antibiotics just in case. And we really felt it important to communicate to both clinicians and their patients that, well, there are harms associated with antibiotics too. And we had to find creative ways to be able to do that. And uh, these videos were actually intended to be projected in dental office uh, waiting rooms. So they would be playing, and the patients would be getting a, a snippet of what their, their provider might be telling them later. So it's prepping them for those conversations. And again, these were popular videos. These just came out a few years ago. And um, from the perspective of number of views, these are actually pretty good. So 6,000 and, and then 1,300. We also leveraged our, our amazing leadership network. So the dental profession, um, there are some superstars in terms of educators and um, evidence-based practice um, leaders, and a huge network there. And so we really tapped into them as well to share and disseminate the content of our guidelines. So this is Elliot. He was one of our dear friends. He taught so many courses at so many different universities across the country. Um, as well as so many virtual programs as well. And he was really passionate about statistics. And so that's where we really leaned into his interests as a person and an educator. And he taught a lot of our evidence-based clinical decision-making videos where he talked about numbers. He was very good at explaining them. So again, we identified skill sets and, and lead into those when it came to our dissemination strategies. And um, we also worked with young people. This was something that I was very passionate about. I realized throughout my career, early career, that I would have really benefited from someone taking the chance and believing in me. Um, and just like I was able to get eventually at the American Dental Association, I realized it would have been even better if it had happened earlier on. So I made it a point to begin an initiative at the American Dental Association to include dental students, dental residents, new dentists in not only the dissemination of our work, but also the development of that work. So we included them um, in the development of systematic reviews. I invited them to sit on guideline panels, not necessarily as an expert, just to provide their perspective from a, a young person, a young clinician's perspective. Um, and we also invited them to sit in, uh, sit together and have conversations about our guidelines. The picture that you see on the screen is um, our two of our amazing young dentists, Aaron and Hannah. They were invited to speak at Midwestern University about the guideline that, uh, on the guideline we did on antibiotic use for tooth, um, dental pain and swelling. And um, they did a wonderful job. There was so much engagement. The entire dental school class was there listening to them. And they asked all of the hard, relevant questions. And we were able to prepare Erin to provide all of those answers. And she was actually a new dentist actually sitting on the guideline panel. So we made it a point to, when we were convening our panels, to make a spot for new dentists we felt had enough expertise to contribute meaningfully to that guideline topic at hand. And in addition to student engagement, we also did a lot of work in stakeholder engagement and also, um, whenever possible, patient engagement as well. This is a list of stakeholders we worked with for the same guideline on antibiotic use for um, dental pain and swelling. This is just a, a, a list. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight on here was that we did stakeholder engagement, that we were really passionate about it, and we put a lot of time and resources in it, into this effort. And this didn't just include, what do you think of the recommendations? We started from the very beginning. We reached out to them, invited them, made sure that if they wanted to send someone to sit on the panel, that they were able to do so whenever appropriate. Um, we engaged them from the development of the PICO questions throughout the process into um, them providing feedback on the recommendations and getting a chance to look at the manuscripts, again, whenever appropriate, before they were published. Um, so these were all ways in which we ensured that the people we were working with were connected to us, that we were 
um, making sure that they really would be happy with the product that we were all collaborating on by the end of it. And also, through these efforts, we made so many friends all across the world. Um, some of them are listed on the slide here, but these include amazing um, team members at Cochrane um, and SDCEP, which is a Scottish uh, group that works on dental, um, dental related systematic reviews and guidelines as well. And one final thing, uh, Eddie had mentioned his interest in emergency uh, physicians work, and this was something I wanted to highlight, which is that we, as part of our guidelines, always thought about who was on the panel, who would be involved in patient care related to the topic at hand. And yes, we were the dental association, and oftentimes we were regarded as just the dental association, but actually so much of the care that's provided is interdisciplinary. So as time went on, we made sure that we really thought about it a little bit big, more big picture and included all of the relevant stakeholders, including physicians, on our panels. And one of the groups we included was the American College of Emergency Physicians, and we ensured that when we were developing our recommendations, we weren't just writing the recommendations in a format that dentists could understand, but also considering how are emergency physicians going to read these uh, recommendations? How are they going to interpret it? Are they usable um, in their clinical practice? And so we made sure that we provided adapted language and really engaged them in that process. We asked them, what do they want to see when they're reading those recommendations? So it's a really interesting exercise, and I think they, I think the collaboration was very effective and. Um, very meaningful. These are some of the chairside guides I mentioned earlier. Uh, we not only, um, well, chairside guides, to, just to explain, are a tool that we developed at the ADA for, to, for clinicians, essentially, to um, help patients understand the evidence and the recommendations chairside, so they could talk together about uh, the recommendations that the ADA was putting out. They were laminated, easy to clean, and we also included different types of graphical representations, figures, visuals, that allowed the patients to, to better understand um, on their terms. And so we included icon arrays, algorithms, and also provided for the patient pages, which actually broke down all of the recommendations and wording that clinicians could easily just read or give to their patients and the patients would understand. So this was very intentionally created um, documents written by a scientific writer trained to write for patients. And so this, these were very popular tools and used widely in the dental field. So two and a half years ago, COVID happened. We learned a lot. Guideline development changed. And um, I actually left the ADA in November 2021. I work for the Infectious Diseases Society of America now. I'm a guideline developer. And one of the most exciting things about all of the amazing accomplishments that me and my team um, had at the ADA were that I not only learned about methodology, but I also learned about people and how to work with people and how to lead people. And um, some of the most amazing work comes from a well-oiled team. And something I wanted to share that IDSA is working on is the Agile Guideline Development Framework. It's not reimagining methods related to guideline development. It's looking at how are my um, guideline development programs actually managed. And my director, John Heald, he's here today, and he has a session, um, SO6, after this plenary, which I encourage all of you to attend. He's going to be talking about how can we put out guidelines quicker, faster, better, um, based on lessons we learned from all of you doing amazing guidelines during this very difficult time in, in our field. Finally, I just wanted to end this section of my presentation by saying that even though I was confused for a very long time, I had the resources, the teams, the projects, the experiences that have allowed me to stand before you today and feel okay sharing my experiences, that I feel like it's okay for me to stand up here and share what I know. Um, because I've had almost a decade of experiences and I, I feel good about it. Um, and this is a far cry from the person in 2011 that had no idea what she wanted to do. And I could not have, again, done any of this without my team at the ADA, honestly, none of it. Um, I re recognized uh, early on in my career, I was a uh, instructor at the University of Michigan in a course called Leadership and Collaboration. I've always been interested in leadership studies and have been involved since I started college. And something that I always heard um, and was reiterated through all of my learnings as well experiences was that leadership is not always visible. Leadership is not always the person getting the credit, that innovation um, happens at every single level, and usually it's the people doing the small work quote unquote small work that actually leads to the innovation that pe other people are celebrated for. So I just wanted to say that 
um, to highlight that I was the person in the middle coordinating all of these activities at the ADA. I am myself a methodologist, was leading methodology at the ADA, but there were so many other methodologists, Im truly impressive, brilliant methodologists who contributed to the work, um, sometimes at a much higher level than I did. And of course, uh, all of our supervisors, scientific content specialists, um, guideline panel members who made this work meaningful and trustworthy, and then of course our communications and marketing teams that actually made the work seen. People actually saw what we were doing. Oh. And here's a picture of all of my wonderful teammates. Um, these are, the top two are my team at the ADA. They, um, I don't think most of them are here uh, at this conference this year. Um, some of them have left the ADA since um, these pictures were taken. Uh, on the left is a guideline panel that we worked with very closely for many years. Uh, they were amazing and really supported our own, um, our guideline program, but also all of us um, as methodologists and trusted us and believed in us, and that really helped us grow as a team and accomplish everything we accomplished as well. And bottom right is uh, my current team at IDSA. I had to put in a plug for them as well. So in summary, innovation is often the result of a cascade, cascade of reflections and actions, um, both on your own as well as with your team. Identifying my personal strengths was a good starting point for me, which was creativity. I was able to lean into that, reframe situations, and really help the program grow. Um, learning is lifelong pursuit. Roles that are best fit, fit for us make us feel good. Thoughtful collaboration is effective and in our field absolutely necessary way to encourage innovation. Leadership is not a role for those at the top, nor is it exclusive. We can all be leaders. And being a team player and building community are essential um, to personal and professional success. So I wanted to acknowledge the team at the ADA that contributed to me being up here again, receiving this award. Alonzo, who encourages everyone to succeed and who makes everyone feel special. Olivia, who's brilliant, um, both an NMA methodologist, but also just a brilliant human being. Lauren, who is so dedicated and hardworking and deserves all of the um, all of the success she has. Sarah, who's kind and compassionate and funny and lights up every room she's in. And Jeff, Tahari, and Rashad, who helped us, um, allowed us to have the work be seen and, again, allowed me to be up here today. Thank you so much. Uh, Malavika, thank you for that inspiring presentation. And as an emergency physician, I want to thank you for adapting your guidelines to my short attention span. That's really, really great of you. Sure. And many of my colleagues as well. Uh, we do have time maybe for a brief kind of a clarifying question. But of course, uh, we're excited about the panel discussion that will follow our three presenters. Is there anyone who wanted to bring something forward? Uh, Richard, are you heading? Yeah, Richard? yeah. go ahead. So. Malavika, you had nothing to be nervous about. <laughs> it was a fabulous presentation Thank with you. beautiful slides, so Thank congratulations. <laughs> Question about stakeholders, mm -hmm. which is a big part of the communication. And you mentioned on one slide that you had developed some customized products for the various stakeholder groups. And I think you had about 15 listed on the slide. Mm -hmm. Were those stakeholders all active members of the guideline development group and represented in your group as well? Or were they just people you reached out to afterwards? Great question. So we had a mixed approach. Um, there were several organizations we actually invited to sit on the panel because they were relevant to the decisions being made. And there were other groups that were um, sometimes invited and declined those invitations, so they didn't actually end up sitting on the panel. And there were some groups we identified from the, the start that they didn't necessarily, um, their involvement wouldn't have added to the, the clinical decision-making process, the decision-making process of the panel, but were incredibly important from a um, feedback perspective. We really wanted to get their feedback throughout the process and also um, ask them to help us disseminate the recommendations at the end. So we had a tiered approach to our strategy depending on the needs of the clinical topic and the panel. And just about how, what percent of the panel were dentists versus the other folks? Oh, a good proportion were dentists, but a, a different types of dentists. So. Okay. ADA represents general dentistry, but we would always, always talk about all of the specialties that were also seeing these patients and if they should have been included as well. And this included medical specialties. When we do ENT guidelines, we try and have about 50% the ENT folks and 50% the others so mm -hmm. they don't 
feel intimidated, and then there's a couple of consumers as well. So yeah, and yeah, we the actually had an, good. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And we actually had an ENT person on our oral cancer guidelines. So we love you guys. <laughs> Maybe one last question before we go to our next speaker. Thanks for the fabulous presentation. I'm Azul Pablo from Brazil. I would like to know how was the process of engaging uh, uh, people, uh, people affected uh, or um, uh, the clients uh, in the process of the materials that you developed to inform them? So how did, was the work received, those yeah. dissemination tools? Yeah, no, how, how was the inclusion in the process of creation of this material? How, how did you include them? This included both the publications and the chair side guides mm -hmm. and other tools. Yeah. So um, we actually had so many different things that we did. Mm -hmm. This included having calls with them. Mm -hmm. This included sending materials out, brainstorming. I mean, this was just an enormous amount of work. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to capture and, and relay, but it was really just making sure that we, we talked to them and they were very happy with the product at the end. Um, and it was just iterative and we brought in different types of people, creative people, people who were good with numbers, people who were good writers, and then tested all of our materials too. We asked people to share the, the tools with their, uh, with their patients and their other peers in their clinics um, and in their, in their programs and we received that feedback and then edited our, our documents and our tools based on that feedback and made it better every single time. So it was iterative, a lot of collaboration. No one person came up with any of it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Malavika. Um, it was really great. We were at a restaurant last night that had great food, and uh, Ellie Ackle uh, managed to get the chef to come speak with us um, and uh, asked him what his secret to success was, and uh, he said passion, um, which I really appreciate you sharing with us today. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tamara Lodfi, who uh, I'm also inspired by every day. Um, Tamara Lodfi is the co-lead of the eCOVID-19 uh, rec map, uh, which is a living recommendations map of COVID-19 recommendations. Um, she's also uh, nearing completion of her PhD in uh, health research methods at McMaster University. And uh, I first met Tamara, uh, she was co-lead uh, of the Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative, uh, which aims to build capacity and strengthen capacity in low middle income countries for evidence synthesis. Um, I probably missed some things, but Tamara, I'd like to invite you to uh, the podium. Hi everyone. Okay. Thank you, Vivian. Um, it's great to be here. So I'm here to talk today about, as uh, Vivian mentioned, the eCOVID-19 rec map or the rec map. Uh, before I start, in terms of knowing how this functions, yes, great. So um, I don't have any conflict of interests, but these are my affiliations. And um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the ECOV-19 RECMAP team and collaborators. We have many of them here and um, evidence spread. <coughs> Sorry. So today we'll visit a couple of things. Um, the ECOV-19 RECMAP, actionable statements and guidelines, plain language recommendations, plain language recommendation trial that we're working on, and the achievements of the RECMAP team. To start, just so that you have access to it, to access the COVID-19 RAC maps, covid19.recmap.org, or you can scan the QR code that we've been trying to disseminate and you've seen them on the backs of some people. So back when WHO declared the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, there was a very high demand for guidelines and that demand was increasing with time. Um, and there were expectations, right? There were expectations to find guidelines, to find guidelines that are available, um, accessible, complete, rigorous, and timely relevant. These expectations were from guideline developers, from healthcare professionals, from stakeholders, um, from patients. So we thought of what would be the best way to answer that demand. So first, in terms of available, we're referring to having guidelines that are captured by systematic regular searches, um, accessible in terms of the resources to access those guidelines, are we paying to access them? Um, in terms of language, are they published in English, in French, in what language are they available? Um, are they complete? So do they have enough information? Um, do they have the actionable statements that they have to have? Do they have evidence of decision tables, for example, some of your findings? Um, did they give any information on who they engaged when they developed the guidelines and other components? 
um, similarly rigorous, rigorous guidelines, right? So are they accompanied by any appraisal score? Do we know what quality these guidelines are? And last, are they timely relevant? Are they answering a priority? So we went back to what we had worked on. So we had developed the WHO ETB uh, recommendations map. And it was um, uh, work that we've done with the WHO Global TB Department. We've built a repository of all their Global TB recommendations. We've um, put them in a map format. You can access the map. It's, uh, it's publicly available. And we've described it in a paper. But the point is we built on the work that we had done. And we reached out to all our networks, to many of our networks, our, uh, people we've already established collaborations with um, and people we knew would be um, a great help to get our work going. Our purpose was to develop something similar to the Global TB Department's REC map and uh, have it focus on COVID recommendations. So first, to identify guidelines, we had um, our search that was in collaboration with the Health Information Research Unit at McMaster University. Um, and we added to the typical search personal contacts. So as guideline developers, we know some guidelines are being developed, not yet published. So we wanted to make sure we're as up to date as possible. And then in terms of what guidelines we were going to include in our REC map, we focused on um, guidelines that actually fit the definition of WHO for guidelines um, published in any form. So whether they're new, adapted, updated, recommendations with methods um, or based on earlier guidelines answering any topic on COVID-19 for any population and with no language restriction. Then we use the Agree2 to tool um, for quality appraisal for the guideline. Um, if you're uh, not familiar with Agree2, so it's a quality appraisal tool for guidelines. Um, it's been used for a long time. It's been tested for a long time. And what we did is it chose the three uh, domains, so agree to has six domains. We chose the three domains that we considered uh, are representing most, are most likely to represent credibility, and those would be domains one, three, six. So domain one, one for scope and purpose, um, domain uh, three for rigor of development, and domain six for editorial independence. And so we provided appraisal for each guideline we've captured, and that was eligible for our REC map. Then we integrated extraction forms within the Great Pro software, which we've used um, to catalog all the recommendations before pushing them on the REC map. So we integrated um, extraction uh, fields, so all the metadata that we wanted to present on the REC map at the next level. And today we have a REC map that actually has captured 5,615 citations that presents 453 guidelines um, and you can see 6,560 recommendations currently on the REC map. Um, and just as note there that 285 guidelines were also captured, appraised, extracted, posted, but then retired because they were out of date. So the REC map has a list view where you can see all the recommendations just listed or a map view. So it's tabulated in a form where the rows would be representing the different populations and the columns in tens. The in tens are um, uh, pulling together the different interventions. You can search for any recommendation you want on the REC map, either using the search bar or by looking specifically for interventions you're interested in. You can also use filters to narrow your search, to specifically look for, let's say, guidelines, uh, recommendations published by a certain organization or that fall under a certain um, threshold for the agree score or that are specifically targeting children, for example. We also linked the REC map to living evidence platforms. So when you choose any recommendation of your interest as part of the information provided, you'll also be able to go directly to the essential medicines list a description of an intervention, if it is an intervention um, in the recommendation that's described in the essentials medic essential medicines list, or you can directly uh, go to the um, LOVE platform by Epistemonicus, which is a living evidence platform. So to describe the full process, we have a paper that's published. I won't go into more details in terms of how we developed it, um, but the purpose of putting all this together is to have trustworthy guidelines out there in the hands of those who will need to use COVID-19 guidelines. 
Until today, we've engaged at least 57 researchers from at least 19 countries, and we have at least 15 volunteers at any time during a month with four interns, and that has been a huge success. And I'm very happy to be presenting here, having so many people in this room um, that I will thank at the end of this presentation. But you can see the very key for our success was this huge, huge collaboration that we've been maintaining for 2.5 years. So once we've been able to do what we were hoping for, the next step was to make the recommendations available for contextualization. So we provide through the RecMap an opportunity for anyone who is interested in contextualizing a certain recommendation to directly click on a box at the end of the page. Um, you simply submit a request for contextualization and you are provided with more information. In particular, um, for our contextualization process, we're following the great adult process, so uh, the great adult approach, so which is a combination of methods to increase efficiency in guideline development, adoption, adaptation, de novo synthesis. And what we do through the RUC map is we provide you with the great pro project that we created. So all the extraction we've done, all the data we've collected on a particular recommendation, the metadata, we provide you with a great profile if you are planning for an adaptation process, an development approach. And um, if you're not familiar with it, in Grade Pro, you can see the different, oh, I should point there, sorry. You could see the different ETD criteria. And then for development, you're able to see the original evidence that was used to answer a particular criteria. And then you're able to use contextual data for different, um, for different uh, criteria of the ETD framework. And this helps to make the final judgments for the adapted recommendation and compare between the original judgments for the original recommendation and the adapted recommendation. So what, are, what were our, our lessons? What lessons did we learn? So first, the map highlights gaps in responding to some priority COVID-19 topics and multiplicity in other topics. Second, recommendations for COVID-19 should be available for different audience at the time of need. And third, COVID-19 guidelines are continuously developed globally. We need to encourage contextualization. So what research opportunities did our project uh, give us? We were able to develop a framework for actionable statements. So we looked at what type of actionable statements are in a guideline. Not all of them are formal recommendations we were able to identify categories um, uh, such as formal recommendations, good practice statements, informal recommendations, implementation considerations, tools and tips, um, remarks, um, and um, we have a full description of those in the paper we've put out there, but also we provide this information in the REC map by labeling each statement that we extract and we post on the REC map with a um, label on top, on the top left, but you can also use one of the filters to specifically, for example, look at good practice statements. <clears throat> Additionally, we looked at whether recommendations answering a similar PICO question or having overlapping PICO components were saying the same thing. And that was one of, the, and we were able to do that because we've had this mapping exercise, because we've coded every recommendation. And so we were able to look at whether um, statements from the same organization of dif or different organizations responding to overlapping PICO components um, were diverging. You can also read more about that. I will not uh, give too much details. And just to say that last uh, research piece was our multi-stakeholder development process to prioritize translate COVID-19 recommendations into plain language recommendations. So um, for plain language recommendations, this is one of our great um, outcomes of this project. It's building a previous work that's been done. Plain language recommendations are easy to read summaries, up to date, published in quality checked recommendations for guideline organizations that our team develops through a multi-stakeholder process before it is published on the work map. Um, it goes through multiple stages, from meetings to drafting, to checking, to citizen editing, to medical editing, and then being posted on the work map. And then it is accessible for everyone, including patients, caregivers, and the public. This is the format of the plain language recommendation. It shows the strength and what it means, additional information, benefits and harms, and it's developed in a way to target different audience. And it even provides an interactive summary of findings table with plain language statements 
and um, it's building on previous work that's been done by our colleagues. You can access the plain language recommendations either from the home page, you can directly just click on uh, plain language recommendations to see the full list, or you can access the plain language recommendation of a particular recommendation when you access, when you are reading it. And just to say that until today we have 54 plain language recommendations, 12 of them are translated to at least six languages. Um, and these plain language recommendations uh, cover different intents and different actionable statement types. And you can visit our poster with our colleague Ashley to learn all the details about the plain language recommendations details. And I'll just mention that we're also running a plain language recommendation trial to test our format in comparison to the standard way a guideline is presented. Um, we've tested it with three populations, the parents, youth, and adults. And uh, so far we have completed our recruitment for um, the parents and youth, we are still recruiting for adults, so please do help us spread the survey. Um, you can learn more about the results of our plain language recommendations trial um, with our colleague Rana tomorrow at a short, short oral presentation, just to say it's a collaboration between three different centers, specifically to get this trial done. And um, it's also uh, a trial combined with a um, qualitative, uh, qualitative study. So finally, I just want to say that because we've done all this work to build this infrastructure, we were also able to take our work to um, other uh, partners or it's actually ready for other diseases, for example, or other fields. So I show you here the uh, e-COVID-19 recommend that we built for WHO, which has WHO recommendations only and other guidance documents by WHO. And last, the uh, big database for recommendations, uh, which is a PAHO WHO grade recommendations for the SDG 3 also based on our RECMAT methods. That was it from my end for the visualization of COVID-19 recommendations. Thank you. And I just wanted to have everyone who's contributed to the RECMAP just wave their hands so we see how many we have today here. That's great. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tamara. Um, it's a massive project, and uh, I don't think it could have been completed without um, people like you uh, making it happen. <laughs> um, any clarifying questions? I think Miloslav. Um, hello, Tamara. Congratulations. It was a very nice presentation of very important project. Very clear. Um, can you please maybe explain to our delegates how we cope with? Uh, the challenge in front of us because each of these guidelines and recommendations, you know, they may have different methodology, different way how they were assessing the certainty of the evidence, re making the recommendations actually, uh, showing the strengths of recommendation. So can you, can you explain how, how we cope with this? For sure. Thank you, Miloslav. Uh, Miloslav is actually a great collaborator and partner in our RECMAP. <laughs> Um, so um, that's really one of the uh, big challenges that we face. Different guidelines use different grading systems. Different guidelines follow, you know, they publish their recommendations <laughs> different ways. Um, and what we've been able to leverage on was the work that our colleagues, uh, led by Mio7 team, have done on transforming the, the grading system. Um, let's, uh, between different grading systems, so we'll call it the visualizing the different uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so visualizing the uh, grading systems and transforming them between, uh, so going from, let's say, non-grade to grade methodology, and you can see that on our rec map. So any recommendation that was graded using a different um, methodology, we've labeled that and we've transformed that, and you can get more input or you can reach out if you need any clarification on that. Thank you, Milsa. One more question, yes. Uh, John Heald, IDSA, thank you for sharing this. Uh, this is awesome. I, on the collaboration map, I was pained to see that there was nothing from the U.S., and I'd like to change that. But I'd like to ask you about how RecMap works kind of on the back end, the search feature. If I heard you correctly, you said the recommendations are coded by individuals. Um, what I'm curious about is if you've explored or thought about the idea of using machine learning, AI, um, things like the Fire HL7 language to code the recommendations and have that algorithm support the search feature. 
Thank you. For sure. Thank you for your question. Um, so first, we do have collaborators from the U.S., and we actually have uh, our colleague uh, Rimo Safa from IDSA, who's part of this uh, project. Just the map was, I think, overwhelmed at some point. Maybe some uh, logos were not clear. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> in terms of, um, sorry, in terms of the coding and all this work that's being done, definitely we are looking into opportunities into making it uh, more efficient, into integrating algorithms and so on. Um, we are working with Evidence Prime, our partners who are taking care of all the IT component of it and have been working on uh, making it uh, more efficient. Um, we're currently, for example, working on a, um, AI for the plain language recommendations. Um, for the search in particular, we do have APIs, so our um, team, the Health Information Research Unit at McMaster, have APIs integrated and uh, screen scrapping and uh, all these processes integrated so that we capture as much as we can. And, uh, you know, we're looking into how to make it more efficient. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tamara. I think um, this is uh, so important to be able to visualize uh, multiple overlapping uh, guidelines for users and uh, it's uh, the first step right so um, I think all ideas are welcome in the discussion session about um, improving uh, on this okay thank you Tamara a great pleasure for me to introduce our third speaker and final speaker for this session um, you know, when it comes to the world of guidelines, there's not too many people where you would say uh, they don't almost don't need an introduction, but uh, Dr. Amir Kasim probably falls into that group. Although for those of you who don't know him, um, I would describe uh, Dr. Kasim as uh, one of the most important contributors to guideline science and impact at multiple levels, both in terms of met methods and robustness, uh, and, and trustworthiness of guidelines, as well as impact through his work with the American College of Physicians. But f and finally, and perhaps most important, uh, as a leader, mentor, and an inspiration, as he has played critical leadership roles in multiple guideline organizations. So uh, you can read more detail in the app, but uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Kassim. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lang, for such a kind introduction. Um, it's going to be a tough act to follow. Uh, really wonderful presentations from my colleagues this morning. And I want to start out by thanking Dr. Shinneman, Dr. Kluger, as well as the Scientific Program Committee of this year uh, for uh, inviting me and for making this possible. So the, to the topic of my talk, is, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is evolution of clinical guidelines and the visualizing their future. And before I start out my disclosure of interest, I have no financial conflicts. I have intellectual conflicts. I didn't list them all. I'm Cochrane U.S., uh, GIN, Grade Working Group, um, European Commission, the list goes on. But I don't take any dollars from them. I do t uh, go out for dinners, so I do work for food. <laughs> <laughs> The better the dinners, the better the uh, work and uh, participation. Just letting you guys know. We had a good dinner last night as well, so thank you, Tamara. Um, so before I get going, um, we were t talking about this gin conference, guys. Do you guys remember when we last met, where, when I last saw many of you? It has been a while. Australia, Zach's hometown, that's where we were. And believe it or not, what shocked me was, because I was talking to Zach and um, Elaine Harrow, CEO of GIN, the other day. I was like, was it 2019 or was it 2020? For some reason, there is like some jumbled up memories here. 2019 and 2020 started getting mixed up in my, in my mind. But what I want to get to is really nice to see you all in person. I think the GIN is about networking. We are here for learning and all that as well. The biggest benefit and what I'm enjoying the most is just seeing all of you in person and you know, meeting, talking, how life has been and all. So I hope we can continue this in-person meetings as we move forward. Uh, Zoom is good for many things, but you can't beat the in-person interactions. Um, and uh, one more thing, I also think that um, for some reason the past few years I've started feeling like you know when we used to have Stone Age and Iron Age and all that? I look at my life as 
the, um, the age of Delta variant, age of Omicron variant, or something along those lines, for real, right? I mean, that's what we've been doing when we're doing some of our work. So just a little bit feel for what I'm going to talk about today, history of clinical guidelines, and you'll see why I want to talk about it. Talk a little bit about the data information visualization. Why can't we visualize our guidelines? What are the potential barriers around it? And then as well as some of the work we are doing at the American College of Physicians. Those of you who might not know, ACP want to give you a feel for it, and the reason simply being is so you can see where I'm coming from. It's the largest medical specialty society in the United States. We use the term world, but when I come to GIN, I hate doing that because there might be some other organization that might be bigger, but we do have 160,000 physician, internal medicine physician members. Internal medicine, again, gastroenterology, pulmonology, the list goes on. Our headquarters are in Philadelphia. That's our building on the right side. Many of you have worked there. We were the GIN 2016 host. We actually hosted great working group meeting as well, so you did come to our office buildings, and um, it, it was fun. I do want to set stage a little bit. What do we mean by visualization? I think it's important. That there are many categories. There are many things that go under visualization. And I think you differentiate some of this stuff based on the visual appeal, the effort that goes into creating some of this work, as well as I think, um, um, what is, uh, how do we end up defining some of this work? So you'll see whatever I'm going with this. Take the example of tables and figures. Tables and figures are visualization, okay? Tables are generally, we have been doing it for years. That's what we all do. We have done it for, for decades. Tables generally summarizes the summary text, what we are trying to describe in the paragraphs. Figures, we're trying to communicate the data. That is visualization. Then came the infographics and information graphics, right? That, that's, that's a very broad term, but that has been out there for a while as well, where we visually display data and information in some clear and uh, clear manner. So the, now comes some of the newer work, visual abstracts. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the visual abstracts a little bit. But basically, visual abstracts is, gives you a flavor of what we are trying to talk about in an article. We had abstracts, right? So abstract is a summary of what's in the paper. Visual abstract is sort of very similar uh, work we're trying to get to. CDC defines visual abstract as visual summary of the key findings of an article. It's an abstract section of an article. And this is what some of the work that I'm gonna focus on. Visual and interactive guidelines. How do we define it? It's a succinct, understandable, and visually appealing synthesis of recommendations and their strengths, the quality of clinical evidence, clinical considerations were very, very important with physicians uh, had on always, for healthcare professionals who have limited time, and I'm gonna get to this as well, the limited time issues for healthcare professionals. And users can engage with these uh, through interactive tools like filters and sliders and all that that comes with it. I'm gonna start with the modern age of clinical guidelines because the definition of clinical guidelines have changed over the years. You, one can argue the guidelines have been in existence since the times of Hippocrates, right? Because there was a manual that was put together by Hippocrates that talked about the diagnosis, the treatments, and whatever was acceptable at that point in time. You can argue that was a guideline. The modern age of guideline, uh, and I haven't listed all the continents over here, so please don't feel like, um, 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 that I'm ignoring, but what, what I know, in the United Kingdom, Royal College of Radiologists started the guide, modern age of guidelines. They took on the topic of pre-op chest x-ray when used uh, routinely, and that led to the guidelines and implementation of these guidelines in the United Kingdom. In the U.S., I do really take pride in this one. American College of Physicians, we started the guidelines program in the mid-70s, actually, depending on how you define, and that's why I put it mid to late 70s, as clinical efficacy and assessment project. We're the oldest guidelines program in the U.S., um, and we also take pride in that we were the first to use the evidence reviews to come up with our guideline recommendation, as well as using the systematic evidence reviews. Um, so what is the current state of guidelines? And again, 
I, I put some examples over here. There are all, many of you who have been doing guidelines, nice, sign. If your name is not there, it's only so many I could have fed over here. Top-notch guideline developers, right? Doing excellent work. But if you think about what we have done over the past decade or so, we have advanced the science and methods a lot. National Academies of Medicine came out with the guideline standard. Guidelines International Network, we had our own standards for guidelines. You're very well aware of it. Great working group. A lot of work is happening in the science and methods area. And which is good, right? We have made our guidelines very solid, evidence-based, based on systematic reviews, need to be ingrained, the evidence needs to back up our recommendations and all that. But what is going on when it comes to the visualization? There are very few guideline developers who have gone in the direction of visualization. If you just can just take a moment, think about the last guideline you guys worked on or have read, you will think about it. it's always the text heavy, intense, it's all tables, the usual that we have all been doing for a very long time. And there is evidence for it, guys. I'm not just making it up. And I'll talk about it. So, since uh, there was a study that was recently published from 96 to uh, 2019, a major guideline developer, the number of pages increased from 26 to 198, and number of references went up from um, to, to 856, and there's reasons for it. That's not negative, it, it, by no means I, I want to say that that's bad, because this is a science is advanced, right? We're doing systematic reviews, of course, and there are more randomized controlled trials that are out there. There's a lot more evidence out there. So you have to look at it all. But that's the reality that's happening. But you know what hasn't changed? Is your ultimate target audience, which is physicians, right? For us, at least. Not for everyone, that's the same case. But I'll give, use the example of physicians. That's why I talked about the ACP piece of it. Uh, physicians have actually now more patients we have less time. It's, it's, it's 12 to 14 minutes per patient, okay? So there is, not come, there is far more pressures on physicians. There are more guidelines that are out there. And what we are hearing, and many of us don't have the luxury to be in the uh, awesome academic center, guys, right? Many of us are, I always use the example of, we need to keep up a physician who's practicing in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, or Ontario, or something. Not everyone is in Toronto and McMaster. So, so once you have that in mind, when they come to us, they say, you need to tell me what's your bottom line recommendation. We have all these pages of systematic reviews, evidence to decision tables. They're looking at you, tell me, I have got this much time with my patient. I need to get to this information and, and help me get to that. We have, we have been doing a couple of things in the past. We have made some changes, and I just want to mention that to you. We have split our evidence reviews, the guidelines, for that very reason. There is an evidence review phase, and then there's a guideline piece to, again, try to provide this information in some sort of a summary fashion. So why visualization is important, and again, just to continue the theme, just make sure that you're convinced about how the importance of it. There are more guidelines available. That's a very gr a crude graph up there, so don't, don't it, it's from PubMed, looking at how many guidelines there are in PubMed. And you can see the increases there from 1990 to now. There are more guidelines out there. So remember when I mentioned that physician who has less time now? Now you're competing, guys, because now you're looking at there are more guidelines that are out there, and how do we get to that physician? So we need to, it's time to change in social media. The, 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 when you're, we are all tweeting, you're trying to make sure that something is visually appealing and it's available in that one tweet. So now you have even limited amount of space that's available. And, and, and non-guideline publications have gone in this arena. I mean, you know, the, because we are a little bit new, randomized control trial. The first trial was um, the streptomycin in 1948. So they do have a little bit of a head start. Um, but, but there are a lot of strategies that are available for non-guidelines world that perhaps we need to look at and bring it uh, in our work. So visual, visual abstract, believe it or not, and again, you may have found, because someone might get up, that's not correct, but to my knowledge, this was the first visual abstract that was published, guys, that was in July of 2016, that's not too long ago, Annals of Surgery. Dr. Ibrahim is supposed, uh, is the brainchild behind it. It's about the coordinated trauma system. And uh, as I said, Annals of Surgery, it was published. It's very simple visual abstract. If you look at it, 
Access to trauma specialists, 16 to 84 percent increase. You get the senior clinicians in, in, in incorporated in there in less than 30 minutes. It's um, 30 to 92 percent increase. What ends up happening? Improved survival, critically ill in the emergency room, 69 percent to 89 percent. Very simple graphic. You, you, we don't know what what what, what uh, the confidence intervals, the details, or um, um, what even is a denominator behind it? They try to communicate this information to, to the, the bottom line, to, 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 to the audience. There have been more improvements. Uh, BMJ has published some visual abstracts. The other one I have up there is cannabis. I have to look over there. I should go to see my ophthalmologist. I can't read that stuff over there. <laughs> I don't wear glasses, but maybe I should. But I drive on the road, so maybe stay off when I'm driving. Um, so ca cannabis for uh, management of symptoms of PTSD. The, you, you can see there are far more details that are out there. There's grade, certainty of evidence, there are confidence intervals over there. So visual ab abstracts have recently ha have started advancing, which is really good news. So what is the evidence for visual abstracts? Again, I know I'm talking to the evidence folks over here. There is increased dissemination and engagement through social media. There is a lot of evidence supporting the more better more the visualization, the more it gets picked up. Elsevier, one of the big publisher, right? Um, they, had, they have uh, found that the, that, the, that the articles that have visual abstracts have doubled the uh, read, reading and uh, compared to the, those without visual abstracts. We still have a lot to learn about, and those are just for thinking sakes. Like, do visual abstracts or visualization of guidelines lead to greater comprehension? That gets a little bit complex to measure because you know it depends on type, how the visual abstract, what does it look like. But the bottom line we're looking at is, do, do we end up changing the behavior? of clinicians. And ultimately, of course, we have to link it to the clinical outcomes. That's what we have to see. Better the visualization, hopefully you're providing better care. And that we still don't know, but time will tell, and I think but the, the surrogate markers are pointing in the right directions. I do want to take a moment over here because it's, uh, it's, it is about visualization, but there are, we have to get our guidelines out to, the, our, again, the audience in different format. That includes podcasts as well. I, don't, I want to make sure that we don't forget that piece, that it's not just about visualization. The more the way we can communicate the message out, the better it is, because we all learn different ways, and again, keep hammering the message. Annals of Internal Medicine has been taking a leadership in producing video summaries, it's been getting a lot of good hits, and I encourage you to look at, at, at that as well. But just, again, that was just a plug-in that don't, don't, just, just keep the beyond visualization. There are other things that still have to happen as well. It is not just about visualization. All right. So moving the pendulum on clinical guidelines, what do we have to do? Some of the work has already started. You're aware of it. The GRADE has published a paper on this about the, uh, visualization. B uh, BMJ Rapidrex is an example that you perhaps have seen uh, recently, as well as the Canadian uh, Preventive Services folks have also published some good work, and it's very impressive work. So there is work has, that has started, but you can see there's not much, though. It's very, very limited. So why? we haven't been able to do that um, is what I wanted to talk about a little bit as well, so you have a feel for it. Ultimately, it comes down to money. That's the reality of things. Visualizing information increases the budget. You're talking about um, a guideline like um, screening, diagnosis, treatment of diabetes or hypertension, one of the big broad topic areas. They can end up costing like a couple of hundred, three hundred thousand, if not more, right? Now you bring in the visualization. That adds to the dollar amount, and you are already like on the brink of, oh my God, do I have to really pay this much? And now you have visualization. On an average, we have found, uh, found that it can end up costing an upward of, for a very simple one, we started off, I think, around 20,000, but now it has skyrocketed. It has gone quite a lot, and I'll talk to you about that, why that happens, starting with staff time, guys. Ultimately, staff time is not free, right? And, and that adds to it software programs, Tableau, um, whatever software program you're using, everything ends up costing money. So financial barrier is there. That's the reality of things. Skill availability is another big hurdle that we have met at American College of Physicians. You need multidisciplinary team. This is its own science. And I can, I think, quite confidently say the majority of the folks here in this room, we're physicians, we're methodologists, we're epidemiologists, statisticians. 
We, are, we do not have expertise when it comes to data visualization. It's its own science. You get degrees in that field, right? So, so what you have to do is you need to not only bring the expertise when it comes to visualization, the data, the communication, because we are working very closely. Communication, again, its own science. Publishing world we have to deal with. Web development, graphics it starts adding up, the, the skills, and that skill is usually not available within your own team. So you can see that how you have to gain that skill set to get to a good visual. And, uh, um, and um, ultimately, everything um, goes in the direction of the dollars, of course. Time, that's another one, right? A, an average guideline, a year, a year and a half, or something like that. Now you're going to talk about visuals. The problem with the visuals is you have to finish the the guideline before you can take on the visuals. The simplest reason being um, you need to have all the information there to come up with the visual. And that extra added timeline now starts creating a problem as well because, you know, we are all living in the world of living reviews and all that. You can already imagine where I'm going with that. Uh, finalizing visuals need to be part of the milestones. There are some added complexities. Guidelines are broad, right? It's, you're not talking about a randomized control trial with a little bit of an information. You can come up with something very simple. Guidelines provide a lot of information. To come up with a, a visual for a guideline is not easy. And add to it the living wor um, guidelines world we are all living in, right? So it, it adds to it. Website capabilities. We still have the print version because we are public. ACP publishing the top-notch journal of our guidelines. So you have to still keep that in mind because half of our readership of our guideline is still reading the print version of the journals, believe it or not, right? So website capability. So now in parallel, you need to have to have this visual that, that's this interactive thing that we're trying to come up with. So it adds to some of the complexities there. And then display across platform, right? Um, the, the phones, uh, uh, the down at Gen, we have abstracts. So you're scanning the QR code, your little screen over there. So those are the things. We, we, it's multiple platforms add to the, some of the real world complexities that we have dealt with. And I didn't realize that in my mind, I thought it's simple and it's not. I'll go um, and now talk a little bit about what, where we have come and where we're going with this. This is like almost decade, decade and a half ago. This was our first visual. So, and think of it like this, that why did we do this? Our, our guideline was already quite short. 3,500 words was my rule. You cannot have a guideline over 3,500. It does not get read. So we had, but then we got the feedback from our, uh, from physicians and, um, and you know, we're an international organization. We gathered the feedback from around the globe. They said, that's too long. You need to give us a pager. That was the pager that's the result of that feedback. It's very simple. It talks about the topic, what are the benefits of intervention, harms, any costs associated with it, clinical considerations, and what are the bottom line recommendations. That was our first visual when we started out with it. It was one pager. I do take pride in that. Where did we end up um, later? So this was the visual, um, what topic? Well, it's the treatment of um, a farm for non-farm for treatment of pain. This got a little bit more complex. We went in the direction of two to three pages because we have to communicate the, the, the outcomes. Um, so I, I, I do have that, yeah. So you can see the outcomes, pain reduction, one to seven days pain reduction. That time we have confidence intervals in there. We have all the interventions listed in there. We tried to communicate that information to our physician. It got actually a lot of um, uh, thumbs up. People like this, this much of an information. This is more re uh, recent example, treatment of COVID-19. And this got complex. So think of it, I have it up there. We had, um, we had the large evidence review. It's, it's about all outpatient treatment of COVID-19, right? So we had a large document, but then we summarized uh, evidence review to, I think it was around 4,000 words. We have our recommendations for like, uh, I think it was 3,000 or so words. That was not going to work. So what we had to do was now figure out how do we create a visual out of it. And it's the most simple visual you can see. We went back to that one pager, and I'll explain to you how, how that worked. It's very simple. Here are the interventions that work. The interventions that didn't work, we didn't even want to deal with it because that's the feedback we got. The physician said, you need to tell me what works because that's what they want to focus on. 
um, and and the way this this is going to work uh, this is working is then then you can get the information website you can hover over it and get the detailed information that might be needed but the benefit of that is this piece can get published just as such into a print version and then anyone can go online and and figure some of the details out this is under review at this point so some of the experiences, if you guys end up taking on the visualization, things to consider before, during, and once you're done. Um, audience. Your target audience is the key. You need to know very clearly who are you trying to, who is going to be reading that guideline, and at what point. Is it at the point of care? Is that the, where, what you're trying to get to? So audience, you need to be clear. Landing spot, meaning is it print? Online, print and online, all that starts making, um, add to the complexities and it's important to think about those things as you're coming up with these visual abstracts. The length of the visual, we keep on going back and forth on the length because there are reasons for it. As I said, the, this is the readership that's telling us, the physicians, that's what they want. Branding guidelines, what I mean by that is that we need to come up with a format so people can start getting a feel for this is what ACP guideline is going to look like, the format. That's what I mean by it. Because we are creatures of habits. So once they start getting, uh, this is again from experience, once they know where to go to get that information. So if someone wants to go just read the recommendation, they need to know where to go. And if someone wants to look at the rationale behind the recommendation, they need to know. So the branding part is very important. And of course, it's, everything is a living process. I feel like my team makes fun of me. I live in the world of living and pilot. I keep on telling them everything is a pilot at ACP and everything is living at ACP. Um, during the color schemes, so these, are, these are little things, which perhaps it might seem like it, but trust me, there is evidence behind it. You don't want to use too many colors, it has to be simple, uh, don't want to, there, there, there's logic behind it. But then you need to link that color schemes to the data how it is getting presented. That goes to sort of a little bit link to the branding, right? So people have, a, they don't have to look at the color coding every time. They should be able to naturally know where we are going with this. Recommendations is the heart and soul of any guideline document and um, that needs to be easily identifiable and when you hover over it, get the rationale and all, but folks should be able to find the recommendation very, very easy in 10 seconds. If they can't find it, they're not going to read it. Um, add reference source link. What I mean by that is like, you know, simple things like a QR code or something like that. So people can go look at the document in detail, those, of, uh, those who might be interested. Once drafted, testing. Test, test, test. Your target audience need to look at it because every time you get a lot of good feedback and the changes that need to be made. This last one is very important, the automation. So to my knowledge, automation still does not exist. So you know all the fancy things you might see like in, even in BMJ, it's not automated, it's hand created. We need to move towards automation, especially to be practical. If you're going to be going in the direction of living guidelines and you have got constant surveillance going on and the data is getting added, it's just not sustainable if we don't have the automation in place. So it's a key variable the pro to, for the success of the program. You need to have automation. If you're producing more than one guideline, right? If you're producing multiple guidelines, we can't afford to have a program if automation is not there. So where do we go from here? So there's been, as I said, even AHRQ, I see my colleagues are sitting here. They've done work on systematic reviews. There's not enough work done that's in the guidelines. And this, this picture, I just want to, um, I'm a nerd, right? I'm a dork at heart. Um, I like universe. I like the planets and stars. This is a new picture. You may have seen the web uh, uh, deep space telescope that went out. You can see there are a lot of stars, galaxies over there. I look at all of you. You're the stars. You're shining in your own region. You are. You are saving lives, guys. Sometimes I feel like we forget that. The, it, the, the improvement in quality of care leads to providing better care, to, not to other people, to our families. I hear back that sometimes my parents or my sister goes, and she's like, oh, the doctor pulled up your guideline. I was like, did you tell her? I was like, who is this? Anyways, so, but you are stars in your own uh, world. You're doing an amazing job. Always take that step back and be very proud of what you're doing. But the reason I brought this, uh, I, this picture is up there, that when this telescope just went up, you know what they're doing? They're not landing in the stars or galaxies. It's all about visualization. It's about making those galaxies, the view clear, so we can learn from how the 
planet started, or what, what information that we can find. The whole billions of dollars concept is based on visualization. So you can see the importance of visualization. I am very proud. I'm partnering with uh, my colleagues at Great Pro. Some of them sitting there, uh, and they have a booth over there. We're partnering with Great Pro and Evidence Prime in this uh, crime, and they're helping us to figure out the whole automation process. This would not be possible because I am just here presenting what my team that is dedicated to do this work. Kate, Itzy, Curtis, Tatiana, and Jenny who have made this possible. You need to have a very, very solid team behind you to make all this work happen. And uh, I can't thank them enough. So thanks so much for listening, guys. All right, um, so maybe a question for Dr. Kasim, or will we also be evolving into the panel discussion? Ben, go ahead. Yes, thanks, Eddie. Uh, really nice talk, Kasim. Uh, uh, so uh, more like a comment, maybe, I don't know, 20 plus years ago, I remember somebody, maybe some of you wrote an uh, article in BMJ, and really talking about this, as you alluded to, to, to time lim time limit time of importance for us to deliver evidence-based care, the point, uh, evidence -based, basically practice, evidence-based practice at the point of care. And the point was made, if you want to get to bottom line, the doctors can use it, clinicians can use it at the point of care, it has to be there within 30 seconds. If you want to understand benefit and harms, and, and again, in an accurate, comprehensible way that you can use it to actually talk to your patient within two minutes. So I kind of really appreciate your comment. And then if you obviously, you have a full review at your own time, whatever. So I really like this testing of visual. And obviously, one day, hopefully, we'll have some, at least some way to search where this visual abstract exists, because you don't have a time to search for them. If you think, actually, in real practice, time, cost of search and time of search is completely, uh, we forget about that. So hopefully maybe there will be some mesh term for that or some, somebody will do a better job in terms of fi finding those visual abstracts. But anyhow, I appreciate your comment actually in terms of testing but taking the time and consideration that we ought to actually deliver that visual abstract that can be, comp that can be understood and clearly conveyed within a two minutes of our time. Thanks. I agree with you. That's all I was going to say. I mean, that, that, that's the key behind it. Because again, for whatever the reasons, and we don't have to debate the reasons, there is an increase in burnout um, in the U.S. There's a lot of paperwork. Physicians are working for their things. That it's just getting more and more complex. I really don't think they even have two minutes at this point. Yeah. And, and there are far more guidelines on any topic. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you've said. Hopefully we can test it. Oh, oh yes. We, and we are. Thanks. Um, so more questions, and I'd also like to invite questions for the panel. So um, I think, please, first. Yes, thank you. Corinna Schaefer, German Agency for Quality in Medicine. Thank you so much, Amir, for definitely addressing the need for testing the interventions that you are using to visualize. And my question is, like, have you tested, have you asked for this physicians before you develop the formats what they wanted, or did you just develop the format and test it afterwards. I'm asking because we tr tried that. We asked German physicians what they wanted as format, and what they came up with was basically algorithms and communicating guidelines. So being able to link recommendations of different guidelines, so providing what, what you said, like interactive guidelines in an online format. And then we tried to change our guidelines and basically base them on interactive algorithms. And when we ask now, what came up with the best rating was these algorithms. And my question is, do ha algorithms have a place in your idea of visualization? And have you discussed this with your um, users? Sorry. Yeah, so there's an agreement over there. I think physicians want algorithms. They don't, that, that's, for, uh, that may, that's how it's supposed to be. The problem that we have run into algorithm is that we have so many of these blank boxes um, where we don't have evidence. And 
We still want to keep the guidelines separate from where guidelines end. We do have work that we do which is called beyond the guidelines, but I think we need to be very clear about that we don't start mixing and matching the two, right? Because we've worked so hard over the past two decades now to talk about systematic reviews, the importance of evidence and all that. So yes, they're looking for algorithms. We have tried to figure out that's the feedback that we got back, but we can't come up with an algorithm from, for, let's say if it's hypertension or diabetes, my classic, right? Your typical internal medicine physician for pro life problems. You, you, have, you have got so many blank boxes that we can't fill them up. And we're trying to figure it out living process is that it's a pilot and it's a living process, but I don't have all the answers yet. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Rebecca. Thank you, hi. Um, I'm Rebecca Thomas, I'm from the World Health Organization. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, it was really uh, very thought provoking. Um, and perhaps my perspective is colored by the fact that we are a World Health Organization, but I had three questions for you. Two are essentially the same. It's really about coming back to the questions of equity. Um, and I think again we're back in this tension space between efficiency, simplicity and equity because I'm a, I'm a human rights lawyer by training and so actually I think one of the struggles we have is actually all the complexity that brings, that equity questions bring into these recommendations. How do you capture that in a single sentence? You know, all of the unpacking of a recommendation, all the conditions that might be necessary to try and challenge the inequities, that's going to be very difficult to put in a very simple uh, recommendation. And similarly, um, one of the things that we struggle with is making these very short visuals acceptable, adaptable, appropriate, culturally relevant, gender sensitive, gender transformative in global settings. So I feel that Holger, you may need to have an ad allotment of visual abstracts at some point in the future. Um, and then my third question is um, really about how, that one of the things that we struggle with is, with WHO is how do you um, ensure the transparency and the efficiency um, juxtaposition, you know, we, we want to be fast and efficient and get these things out quickly, but at the same time we want to make sure that our end users know our guidelines are trustworthy, and the only way to do that is to make sure all the information is transparent. So we don't publish guidelines unless the evidence is publicly available, unless you can go and see how it was developed and all of that methodology is clear and recorded. But at the same time, you know, we publish rapid, re rapid recommendations. So how have you, or how do you, or how do you suggest we, we, we try and deal with that? Thanks. Sure, so um, I'll answer that as part of the work that we've done for the RecMap, we actually looked at the different components that were published um, within guidelines by different organizations. Um, we actually provide, for example, equity filters on the RecMap. We looked at the Progress Plus framework by Cochrane. We provide this information. And I think the key of the RecMap right now, having all these recommendations there and providing all this metadata with it, um, is that it helps us see what are guidelines actually covering and what are, are they not. Um, do we have this information out there? And for us as guideline developers, if we're having a f hard time finding this information, how is the public going to find the information they need? Um, yeah, so that's from our perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, so I agree with you, and I think that's the benefit of this visualization. I wholeheartedly agree that information needs to be transparently and openly available how we got to those recommendations. So it's the layered approach, right? So if, 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 a, if, a, if a physician who is with the, at the pa uh, sitting with the patient needs to look at just the recommendation, so be it. But if they want to dive into the evidence, how they, what was the, re so it's the, it's, it's the recommendation, then it's going to be the rationale, and equity and all that needs to be there. I absolutely, and we're trying to figure it out how key, to keep it um, as short as possible, but that access to that information is, that's what we are doing. It's, it's openly available from evidence to decision table to summary of findings table. You keep on looking at it, that, that QR code or whatever, the reference document, that's what I meant with it. Great. Um, I'd like to, I know there's questions in the room. I'd just like to ask a Malavika uh, question. Um, it strikes me from your presentation about um, your, your, I would say, your two lives of creativity and, and professional, and this um, sort of challenge of visualization. I, I just wanted to ask you about how um, you see that sort of creativity coming into these kinds of innovations. Thank you. Um, I think that when we're uh, developing a clinical practice guideline, it is so methods heavy. We're starting with the clinical questions, working with the panel, doing an entire uh, 
complicated systematic review, getting to the end, we're exhausted. And as he said, you know, it's a, it's a last thing we're thinking about. How do we visualize the recommendations? How do we communicate them? Um, and everyone's tired at that point. And I think that one of the um, things that really helps us is to just take a break, um, just keep an open mind, and think about how would someone reading these recommendations, how would they want this in, uh, information communicated? What would make it easiest for them? So depending on the clinical topic, um, we, choose, uh, we, we actually went to the research and really looked at for these types of um, clinical conditions or patient populations or um, providers, how do they want to be communicated to? So we would talk with them, engage with them, read papers associated with how to visualize or um, display that content and then test those make them, and like um, he said also, we worked with professionals who actually know what colors to choose, what graphics to choose, and then we, we put it on paper, we again test it again, and then we put it out, and I think the creativity part is just really being open-minded and not feeling that you have to copy somebody else or um, be stuck in a box that maybe there are better ways to, better ways to do things, so I think that's where that comes in. It's all, it's all iterative and it's all, um, it's all extremely collaborative. I don't think as a methodologist, I need to know exactly how, how to display or visualize my recommendations. That's great, yeah. great. Um, Ashley, and I love that you mentioned that the visualizations were laminated for the dentist. <laughs> um, okay. Sure side guides. You may have noticed um, an algorithm on there. This was something that we were actually challenged about, you know, oh, dentists, we don't, we don't need algorithms. We can't use them. They won't know how to use them. Literally nothing but love for the algorithms. So I think there really is this, this question that we asked ourselves, why are we acting differently than, you know, how physicians are practicing? And really there's very little difference between clinical decision making in medicine and dentistry. So I think, um, yeah, we're, we're, again, gl glad to be here and I'm glad to represent dentistry on this panel. So. Great. Um, okay, I think for questions in the audience, um, yeah. come here first and then to Holger. Thank yes. you. Mary Nix from AHRQ. So as we, I'm a visual person, so I'm totally into this session. Um, and as um, an employee of a public health agency, the issue of dealing with the infodemic of dis and misinformation is still very palpable. How do we leverage this work that you're each doing to battle that, to get that trusted evidence out there in these snippets, especially on social media, that get the attention of the masses? If you could address that, please, thank you. Um, so I'll start with work that we're doing. Um, the work map for us is a, you know, it's where we're starting with, we're starting with RECMAP to go bigger. We have a knowledge mobilization approach that we're working on right now, actually, where we'll be engaging with 10 different groups over the coming year to see how usable and to who is RECMAP usable and what are the challenges until this stage, um, until this point with all the work that we've done and understand how we can make different um, messages get to the right audience and how we can make recommendations that are trustworthy um, easily searchable by anyone in the public. How can we deliver the right messages on the right platforms? So we're working with uh, patient partners, we're working with uh, marginalized communities, we're working with um, different groups globally actually with uh, systematic review authors. Um, and we're hoping that this would help us come a step closer towards finding those right tools and channels. Um, in addition to that, we really believe that plain language recommendations are going to be a strong tool um, because they are speaking the language that would be the most common, delivering the right messages, enough messages, not too much information, and linking to the evidence that we're used to developing them. I just wanted to say one thing. When we were working with our communications, marketing, social media teams, it was always a challenge because we were so tied up with the recommendations. We understand, understood the nuances of it and the complexity of it, and we didn't want them to get it wrong. 
Um, but then they would come back and say, we can't say all of this in this message. There's only so much we can say. Um, people are going to get exhausted. People are not going to understand the complexity, nor do they need to. So we really prioritized what pieces of information we wanted to share, and usually those were some of the more straightforward, strong recommendations, people, the ones that there may not be so much variability um, in how people would implement those implement, uh, recommendations. And so we would prior, prioritize those for the social media marketing campaigns. Um, and then for some of those more nuanced recommendations, we would find other strategies to, to display or communicate those findings. So just an overview of how we worked with those specialized teams. So you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, especially COVID-19 times, we all know how much information was there and misinformation that was out there. So there are a few efforts that are underway that I can specifically point you to. ACP is partnering with Google, and we are taking this head on, the, the trustworthy information. We're going to come up with very specific guidance that ha help uh, our public members to figure out what is good information, what's not so good information. Um, there, in, there, there is an international effort that's underway. ACP is partnering with WHO as well as Council of Medical Specialty Society in the U.S. as well. Um, and we're going to come up with a trustworthy guidance uh, uh, essentially pointing towards that how do you identify the good information. You're going to be seeing some of this information soon for the reasons that you just pointed out at AHRQ. Thank you for that. Um, why don't we go over to Holger? Yeah, perhaps Tamara already answered this question. Holger Schunemann, let's say I'm with Jin today. Um, so, in terms of my affiliation, um, Tamara, you in part answered that question, but um, let me step back for a second. Why did we need, or why do we need these plain language recommendations? I think that's, uh, that's my very first question. I'll, I'll have a, I have a follow-up item for possibly Amir. It's important to understand why, so it might be good um, if you can allude or, or explain um, that a little bit more. And I wanted to follow up on what Rebecca Thomas was, I think, asking about, and that is there is a WHO recommendation. This is being translated into plain language. First of all, we should ask, should that even be necessary? But um, how is quality assured in this process? Because um, I think actually that is a very, very important point. I looked at one of um, Amir's slides up there, and I hate to be a stickler, but um, the quality, it was a beautiful talk, um, but the quality control seems to be important. You had on one slide, um, your bottom line was evidence support, um, does not support use. Then below you said, the recommendation actually said to not use these drugs. And there is a very fine difference. And I think this is the quality control piece that when things get into the editor, into the hands of editors, that they are confused. There's a difference between, again, evidence um, does not support the use or to say evidence um, supports to not use it. And these fine nuances, because you actually had it in the recommendation. But, and then coming back to Rebecca's point as well, I don't think it's been fully addressed, but I'm very interested in the, in the answer. I thought her equity comment was relating to um, making the access to recommendations equitable, um, as opposed to considering equity in the actual um, 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 recommendation, which is, again, a different thing. And the plain language recommendations are possibly one method but how do you ensure that globally um, these recommendations are not transformed into something that looks actually quite different from the original version? So um, I wonder what the panel thinks about that. Thank you, Holger. Um, so I'll start with why plain language recommendations. So plain language recommendations because we want the recommendations that are out there not to be only used by physicians. We want anyone who will be affected by them to be able to understand why a certain intervention is being recommended or not, in what setting, um, using a language that is common, following a process of development that is very rigorous. Um, so the framework for developing plain language recommendations is based on previous work that our colleagues have led um, and based on the GIN public toolkit. And it is in uh, consultation with citizens, um, the uh, plain language uh, version is developed, it's then uh, verified, it's been, uh, and then it's uh, edited by citizens, then edited um, by a medical expert, and then it's published on the RecMap. Um, so we have this full process. 
Um, and of course, we're keeping track to make sure the recommendation for which they belong to is still up to date. It has not been replaced by a newer version. If it is, we go back and we update the content of the plain language recommendation. Um, the second thing is, it is, um, you know, it brings us closer to all the audience or to the right audience who will be affected, as I mentioned. Um, and our knowledge mobilization approach that we'll be following right now is really our key, I think, to making sure that there's equitable access to um, the information and the recommendations. So, uh, sorry, to, in presenting and making recommendations available. So. First, the RecMap is a free, for example, online tool that's accessible for anyone, anywhere in the world. Uh, we've worked with global partners to ensure that um, what we're putting out there can be accessed by as many as possible. Second, um, we work with guideline developers globally to make sure also that we are um, capturing their guidelines from anywhere in the world. Um, third, there's, the, um, there's a rigorous process for us to monitor what's being out there. So when we have all these metadata that we're extracting, whether they're in, related to the ETDs, the SOFs, or implementation considerations, or um, any a contextual factor and so on, and we're presenting them out there, putting, making them available, accessible, um, making it easier then for someone from the public to go through a full guideline that's 100 pages, for example, that's one step closer to uh, making it easier to access the information. The uh, second thing is that we consult, so we have a lot of ongoing con communication with guideline developers, for example, in terms of the appraisal that we present out there for guidelines. So we appraise the quality of the guidelines, we inform guideline developers that we've captured, appraised, extracted their guideline, and it's now up there on the rec map. And we get contacted by them saying, well, you know, we would like to discuss why we got that score or this score. And we actually saw improvement in reporting of some guidelines and making more information published and publicly available by some organizations, and that's a huge success factor to us in terms of the work that we've been able to do. Um, the other thing is, again, and um, I stress on it, as guideline methodologists, developers, we're familiar with what needs to be out there. So we know what to look for and where to look for it, but other people don't. And I think this is why we're all here, to work on what is the best approach, and we're trying to do that by collaborating with the right people, engaging as many as we can, and finding the right uh, language and tool. I hope I answered all your questions. So. <laughs> Does it, go ahead. So, j just a quick response. I mean, so I, I don't know what slide, but I can tell you the quality control is exactly, you're absolutely right. And we learned pretty quick with the visual that it has to be sequential. And remember, so we are publishing in a peer review journal, so we are in parallel going through all that too, guys. We get the comments from the reviewers, you're responding to that. And that's the, what I was talking about, the sequential approach and significant timeline that gets, and the time ends up getting added to your timeline that we have to be careful about. But you're right about quality control is critical key. And component. Go, go ahead. Great. We, can ch we can chat later. I think we have another question over there. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Qi Wang from McMaster University, also collaborating with uh, Lanzhou University in China. I have uh, two uh, comments for further consideration. The first one is about, uh, I think Jin community could uh, create a one-stop shop for the uh, viralization to designing or collecting or providing some cartoons, some images for for Jane community to use when they would like to uh, viralize the guideline or recommendation because it must, it should be cost effectiveness, effective. Um, then uh, some team might be very rich, have funding, and some team might uh, not have funding, and then we can support each other as a community. Maybe one-stop shop is uh, very necessary. Uh, another comment is that uh, we, we talk about figures or tables, visualization, but sometimes we might to co uh, consider about the audio, the, the audio visualization. And uh, like uh, the test book, uh, we have the, we, we sometimes we will have the audio, audio book for listening. I think uh, maybe this is, might be a good approach for uh, promoting or disseminating guideline implementation. Thank you. Great, thank you, T. Um, I think that's just a comment, but would any of the panel like to comment on that? 
I, I agree with you, and so Jin leadership is sitting here. We can discuss it. We have a board meeting coming up. That's a great idea to create a community over there. As far as the, about the, the hearing part goes, that's what exactly I said in that slide. That visual is just one option. So podcasts and whatever other formats you want to have, you absolutely need to. It's a multi-pronged approach. It is not just about visualization. So I agree. Great, Craig. No, just maybe um, encourage people if there are any more questions. Um, we'll we'll wrap up uh, at ten two. So, yes, go ahead, Craig. Craig Umshed from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in the U.S. Uh, like Mary Nix, my colleague, I really enjoyed this this discussion. Uh, so, want to thank you all for your presentations. Uh, as Amir was saying, um, at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, we have been experimenting a bit with infographics and also interactive data visualizations for our systematic reviews. And we've tried to put some thought into this, and I just wanted to make the point that, um, you know, so much of this work is relevant for clinicians at the point of care, but so much of it is also relevant for other stakeholders. And sometimes those other stakeholders are the prime targets of, of this outreach, you know, whether that be patients, which we commonly talk about. But for us, healthcare systems, hospital system leaders and administrators, um, policy makers, uh, state level policy makers. So depending on who our audience is, obviously our, our, um, our visualization may be a bit different. So for us, we very much use infographics to try and surface the main findings of our dense reviews, um, to try and engage people in looking at the review further, trying to open up that review. For our hospital system leaders, we've tried to use interactive data visualizations, which we imagine they could use uh, in decision-making settings, where they look at different interventions, trying to understand their impact on different outcomes and the certainty of evidence. So I just wanted to make that point. The, the one other point I'll make is, uh, in, the, in the chaos of clinical care, at least in the United States, the EHR is the portal which providers are obviously using to deliver care, for good or for bad. Um, I'll try and be agnostic on that. But I think that's where clinical pathways really come into place. I think oftentimes, um, you know, if you were to do a time motion study in most practitioners' office, at least in the U.S., they're not going to resources to uh, look up information. They're, they're making orders. They may be looking at some of these reference tools by some of our publishers like UpToDate or Dynamed. Uh, and that's where I think pathways can be incredibly helpful for these providers, particularly at the point of care, where we can bake it in. And I just want to, to share one quick experience uh, I had a couple years back. Um, I was previously at the University of Chicago, and we created a pathways program. And one of the nice things about that pathways program was the pathways were directly integrated into the EHR such that a clinician could follow the pathway and place orders through the pathway, which is, which is a bit unusual. Um, and what we found during COVID was that that was a tremendous benefit to get real world, uh, real time evidence to the point of care. We had over 100,000 orders placed through those pathways in the first four months of COVID. So that's what our clinicians were relying on to, to ensure that they were practicing evidence-based care. So I just wanted to second that comment that was made earlier. Thanks. Great, thanks, Craig. Um, any comments on from the panel about how um, these sorts of visualizations can be more integrated into getting into people's hands? We're all we're all running out of steam. Are there one more question? Or two more questions? And these. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Carolina. I'm from the European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. So we are talking about access to information, avoiding disinformation, plain language summaries, and recommendations. And my question relies on the fact that uh, after COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there has been um, a major fact, in my opinion, that uh, has been that uh, Facebook uh, was censoring one article by BMG about COVID-19. Uh, so um, also it has happened again like a couple of months later with another art systematic review from, from Cochrane. And as far as I know, uh, BMG um, 
make an editorial uh, talking to Facebook that uh, they um, were avoiding the dissemination of an article that was peer review, and they say that this article was, uh, that there was missing information, misleading information, and there was a lack of context on the article, so if we produce evidence um, and rigorous papers, then, then they are going to be censored by another media like Facebook, how we should fight against this. Or my question is how, this, how you would react to this fact that, for example, Facebook uh, censored an article of the ACP or the McMaster University. Thank you. So in, at, I, I, at least in the US, the, any of these social media giants or search engine joints, they're in trouble for that very reason. So the Googles and the, 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 the Facebooks, they, they, they have been asked in the Congress, I'm sure you guys have watched it, so these partnerships that are talking about that we're sitting down now with ACP, that the Google is sitting down and we're defining what is trustworthy information to ex exactly take that on. I don't know if there are other efforts underway. I mean, there are the colleagues over here who might know more about Europe or Australia if you want to chime in, but the work has already started to address this problem. Okay. Uh, anyone has uh, from other continents, regions, are you guys doing some work? Anyone wants to chime in or add? Yeah, I thought, I mean, it's a great question. I, I think there was a, a Cochrane uh, review that got labeled as uh, misinformation. Uh, I think uh, some people are nodding. I can't remember the details. Um, I think uh, we can uh, wrap up this session uh, to give you a gift of time. Um, I'd really like to thank the three speakers. I think um, we can take away from this session, you know, there are almost as many ways to visualize evidence as there are stars in the galaxy. Uh, and um, it really takes a team to, to, um, to do this uh, and to do it well. And uh, I think last thing that just comes to me from this session is um, just the benefit of uh, sessions like these, conferences like these, where you get to network with people doing um, so many different things. Um, and uh, please go out and network. And uh, thank you to the speakers.